Mm. Welcome to the fine print, ladies and gentlemen. I am your host, Caleb Teske, and today we got a great interview for you. And of course, uh, before we get into that, as always, I'd like to send a couple of shout outs uh, to everybody who, who checked out my last couple of interviews with uh, Stacy Wachowski. Stacy, thank you so much for, for joining me, talking about labor relations in the cannabis industry. That was that was excellent. And uh, even got some comments from my mom there. That was great, mom. Uh, happy Mother's Day late. Um, also, everybody who who tuned in to check out my interview with, with Charles Alkire, the um, uh, Army veteran who, and cannabis entrepreneur who joined us, who had some really fascinating things to say about some of these real estate deals in the cannabis industry. And um, it, it was a perfect interview to do because that's really going to tie in with my next guest here. And um, I want to introduce him now. Well, boy, we already got a comment here. Uh, I'm going to bring him in. Bang. Welcome to the fine print. It's David Rabinovitz. David, thank you for joining me tonight. Caleb, it's great to be with you. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. And we got our first comment here from Peasy to be blunt at the to be blunt podcast. Yes, sir. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I love your show. Peasy, man. Keep it up. dude. It's looking great. Um, another podcast host there. Um, David, before we get into anything serious, I always ask my guests if they would share a five minute life story with us. Okay, so uh, you and I were talking earlier about last names, right? That sort of thing. So I, I guess we can talk a little bit about that. And we were, we were trying to, my, I usually figure it takes it until, until about November before somebody spells my last name correctly. Um, and, and we're going back and forth on that. And I explained to Caleb, you get people who are in the same family who often have different last names because it depends upon which island you, I rather, which line you came through Ellis Island in. And how how thick your accent was, that sort of thing, and how the person who you're going to, who you met there interprets it when they gave you your American last name. So that's kind of like how I ended up with the last. My family ended up with the last name Rabinovitz, and I got relatives that spell it different ways. I don't know if that's exciting, but that's our today's story. What was the name? What was the name before Rabinovitz? Well, that 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 as far as I know, that was it. I think the oh. what we were talking about earlier was the name on my my grandmother's side which had stayed, that family, her husband's family had started off in Spain with the name Oslander or something along those lines. And because of the way they wrote the S, it eventually got interpreted as an F. And then they dropped the ER and it became Ufland. Hmm. I, I find that, I find a lot of things fascinating, but last names can kind of be interesting when you dig into it, how we came to have last names and, and all that sort of stuff. Would you tell us, you know, sort of where you grew up, where you went to school, all the that basic sure. sort of trivia shit. So I grew up in Boston in the 1960s, and it was a real tumultuous time in the uh, early 70s. We moved out to the suburbs, but we weren't far from Boston. I lived in this area my whole life, except for a few years in my 50s. I was living in New York City. It would have been really cool if I was your age living in New York City. But as a 50 something year old. And it just wasn't quite exciting. Um, actually, I stayed there for only about nine months and I moved back. But I've generally always been from the Boston area. What did you do in college, David? Studied and worked, man. I worked like I was a poor kid. So when I was uh, I was on the co-op program. So when I was in school, I was probably working about 40 hours a week. And then when I was, I was in, in on the co-op program, I always tried to because I was good with numbers. I always tried to work 67 hours a week. Because when you're getting paid horrible wages, if you work 67 hours a week on an hourly job with time and a half, you get two weeks pay. So that's how I put myself through school. I, I didn't want to take out too many loans. So you went to school back in the day where you could still work your way through college. You know, I think you probably could right now. It's just a lot harder. I mean, back then, a, a tuition for a semester was like, I don't know, $2,000. But where minimum wage is like $15 today, back then it was about 2 bucks. Hmm. I, I we'd have to scale that and get it on a map and see if right. it, <laughs> yep. yeah. and what did you study in college david i feel like i gave a little bit away but uh, tell us what you did please so my undergrad was in uh i went to a business northeastern university for business uh i i they had con they didn't have majors and minors they had concentration so i had a con took a concentration in um entre in finance I really liked the finance courses. Um, 
So then I took a small business finance course. So I picked up entrepreneurship and then I picked up management. So by the time I graduated, I had um, what they called a triple concentration. Then I went back to school because it's never too old in my mid 40s to get a master's degree. And that was uh, coming up on a couple of years, 18 years ago. So wow. time goes by quick. <laughs> And, and the the one thing that we connected on, I feel like, was was the stuff about the real estate and, and um, this other tag you have after your um, your name on LinkedIn, this CLFP. Could you please explain what that means to me? That my is view? for the I spent 20 something years in the equipment finance industry, and that is a, a certified lease finance professional. But. It's just letters, you know, it's a, every industry they throw that you're allowed to accumulate a whole bunch of letters. I don't use that anymore. I'm not in the equipment finance industry, but it's nice because when I'm talking, there are a lot of people in the, who are pitching to cannabis entrepreneurs about offering financing. And when, when I've got clients who are going through that, I'm usually pretty good at cutting right to the chase to figure out whether they're going to get screwed and how badly. Mm. And you said you came from kind of a poor background. And now you're you're sort of um, moving into this world of of finance. That might uh, must be quite like a a bit of change for you there. Yeah, you know, I, you know, it it, it is the the uh, story of if you work really hard, you find a way. Mm -hmm. I'm not, mm. The American dream sort of story. I, I don't want to go quite to that. Uh, you know, like I start, I came with nothing, and I and I'm running a Fortune 500 company or anything like that. But you know. I, I, I can't say I haven't, you know, life has been okay to me. It's been an interesting journey last 40 professional years. And, uh, um, you know, and I'm, and I'm finding the cannabis industry fascinating. Mm. And I have one more question for you before we get into the serious stuff. What, what is behind you? Could you tell us about what that? Behind me? So my fiance loves moose. And if you ever want to see a moose and go on a moose tour, Either A, don't get on the bus with her, or B, whatever side of the bus she's on, go to the other side. She's also uber smart. And a few years ago, she decided she was going to get her doctor's degree at Johns Hopkins. So she had just finished her comps, which is some test you have to do when you're going for a doctorate degree. And there had been um, advertised in Facebook Marketplace, like these eight foot tall wooden, wooden carved moose. And um, one of them had sold and it must have been like eight months later and there was still one left. And I got in touch with the per people who were selling it, um, cut a deal because it was not in good shape, surprised her. We bought it, brought it home, spent a weekend and it looked like hell. Spent a weekend cleaning it up and pressure washing it and staining it and painting it. And so now we have in our sunroom this <laughs> eight foot tall moose. <laughs> and it's standing up. Yeah, it's standing up, you know. Car is it, wearing a, top, is it wearing a top hat? Is it what? Is it wearing a top hat? No. Hold oh, on. Okay. Hold on. Oh, okay. <laughs> we call oh, him. Okay. There we go. Max wow. The moose. Wow. That's beautifully carved there. Yeah. It, it, it's a beautiful piece. It's funny. Yeah. I was telling someone about, I was showing somebody the moose one day. And they said to me, I know that moose. It, you, that used to be in, a, in front of an ice cream shop in New Hampshire. And that's where it had come from. <laughs> Apparently, the ice cream shop had the two moose up there. They closed up the ice cream shop and the daughter bought them, brought them down to Massachusetts. <laughs> we have a lot of really, if, I, if, you know, if this were a different show, I'd walk you through the yard. We got tons of really cool, weird art. Here's our kitchen table. Oh, shit. Look at that. There's, uh, let's see, I'm going to spin this around, but wow. uh, it's some Af African statue. Tell me when you see the moose that's on the uh, center table here. Oh. What? Right there. Oh, there, yeah, okay. And there's a gorilla <laughs> that we picked up at a, an estate sale in Maine over by the window. Ah, and it looks like you got some trees around you, so you're not you're not right in the heart of Boston. Oh, no, we're out, we're, uh, we're about a, a few miles south of Gillette Stadium in Foxborough for people oh, who know sure. the area. So we're in the town of Plainville, right near the Rhode Island border. 
We got a pond on the property with two dams. It's fed by a stream and we feed a larger lake. I've spent the last year working on the dams. My hope for this summer is to build a small hydroelectric, uh, for lack of a better term, plant. Figure out how to get, a, we got a lot of water that goes through. So I want to figure out how to get electricity out of it. Oh, cool. Yeah. Oh, a little bit of engineering. That's kind of up my alley. That's it. <laughs> now, the real reason I brought you on, obviously, I saw some of your comments on LinkedIn. And, and this is, um, you know, nobody's watching right now. And thank God, because this is way out of my wheelhouse right here, David. Um, okay. I've, I also grew up poor. So finance and real estate are things that I've never really um, gone into because I don't have any money. However, yeah. you seem like the guy and a couple of people already chimed in. They were like, oh, David's the guy to talk to about this. A couple of your friends there from LinkedIn. Um, OK, so, so um, I'd like to sort of know how you decided. You, obviously, you did the, the MBA in college and the um, CLFP stuff. And I'd like to know sort of since cannabis is sort of um, what I'm covering. How did you decide to transition over into to that industry or what got you interested? That's a bizarre story. So I, um, I was in the equipment leasing industry, went back to college at 44. It was a one year intensive program, came out with a master's degree and ended up in the consulting field. And um, a friend of mine had gone to work for a company called Young Broadcasters of America run by a, a former Nesson sportscaster named Jimmy Young. And what Jimmy did is he trained high school kids how to become, uh, really how to do public speaking and have a camera presence and, um, and do sportscasting. They would bring in sports celebrities, the kids would interview them. But the, the, uh, my Jimmy was having some issues. And my friend asked me to do some pro bono consulting work for him. So I agreed to do that. And when they told me where he was located, I said, oh, I know that building. It's the old multimedia communications building. And the guy had been a client, the fellow who owned the building had been a client of mine 25 years prior when I was in the equipment leasing industry. And apparently he still owned the building. Um, he was leasing equipment and the studio to Jimmy. They were looking to raise some money. We went down and met with him. He and I reconnected and he summered in Narragansett, Rhode Island, and wintered down in Arizona. And when he went back to Arizona in 2010, called me up in December and he said, I want to give your name to somebody. This guy could really use your help. You're the right person for him, but I want your permission before I give you na your name to him. He's a doctor and he's in the cannabis space. He said, but I promise you it's legal. But it was a strategy assignment. It wasn't going to be a big lift. So I said, yeah, I'll help him out. He was trying to put a deal together with somebody in LA on cannabis vending machines. And I helped him out, sent him on his way. And that was like the end of it. Three Thank months later, he called back and he said, I want to give your name to this guy in LA rather than buy the company we threw in together. And uh, they hired me every time a state legalized medical marijuana to analyze the law of the regs, write a white paper, figure out what their strategy should be. And they would basically come in like licensing consultants. And um, it just kind of grew from there. By 2012, Massachusetts had legalized for medical purposes. I knew they were going to hire me to analyze the law in my home state. So I put together a team to go after a license. We could smell how political it was. And we pulled out literally two or three hours before the application was due. So, so um, the state, the state um, approached you to do some consulting when they rolled out legalization in Massachusetts. Well, yeah, sort of when they when they had the rec program come in and they had the social equity component, the Cannabis Control Commission was looking for somebody to put together training programs. And since now I was really kind of, I, I was my part time gig was doing the cannabis stuff and my client list was growing. <clears throat> my fiance, who's a college professor, said, hey, why don't we go after one of these contracts? So I was the subject matter expert understanding the 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 industry construct of cannabis. I know nothing about the plant. I vape every night, but you could take, you could take the greens off a carrot, put a little bit of a, some, something to give it the right set, grind it up. And I wouldn't know the difference. Right. But I understand the industry construct. I understand all the technical side of what you need to know. That's really what I find fascinating about this industry. I, mean, I appreciate your honesty there, David. Yep. This is the only time we've ever had an industry in the United States. that's illegal at the federal level legal at the state level, 
kind of regulated at a local level and then tolerated by the feds, not through any legislation, but a whole bunch of guidance memos that make it kind of interesting to try to figure out how it's all going to work. Is this the only time that's happened where, where something is federally illegal and, and legal on the state level? It, and, and, the feds, and the feds kind of and the feds allow it. Yeah, this is the first time in the history of the country that or at least that I'm aware of that this has happened. That's what makes this industry so fascinating. It's certainly the first time that I can recall in my lifetime. Right. Yep. Hmm. So and, and so um, the um, one thing I've been talking with a lot of people about is how how much this industry is really based around um, real estate uh, yeah. because in order to have your own grow operation, you need to own your own property or have a real nice relationship with your landlord. And, and that's, uh, I assume, you know, I live up here in Vermont. There's land everywhere. Um, you live down, you know, in Massachusetts where I assume it's much tougher to find cultivation space. And, um, you know, I'd like to, I'd like to dig into this real estate piece of this industry because it's something sure. that's really over my head. And, and, and I'd like to know sort of, you know, since, since we talked about restructuring debt, I assume there's a lot of bad deals being made. I'd like to know sort of how you get into those bad deals and how we maybe avoid um, setting yourself up in those bad deals. The best way to avoid getting into a bad deal, if you're going to get into a deal, is get somebody on your team with experience. And it doesn't have to be cannabis experience. You just got to make sure they understand what some of the issues are. But most of the folks I've seen that have gotten into bad deals, two issues. They don't understand the industry. And I've talked to people who've raised over a hundred million dollars and I've walked away saying, these guys just don't get what they're, what, what this industry is all about. For example, the, the, we've got the greatest economy in the world in the United States. And one of the reasons we have that is the way our founding fathers designed it. So states can't erect artificial borders at their state line to say, gee, uh, we may border with Vermont up in the northwest part of Massachusetts, but we're not going to allow Vermont farmers to ship their milk into Massachusetts. So as a result of that, we have interstate commerce. Because there's, there's some interesting reasons why, but the states made an assumption that when they legalized cannabis locally, that the feds weren't going to allow them to ship it over state lines. And the states created these pockets so that if you're in Massachusetts, you got to grow it here and you can only sell it here and you can't sell it out of state. And that means if you have a farm and let's say you've got a farm in upstate New York and you could grow a lot of really good cannabis and you could supply New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, Massachusetts, Vermont, you can't. So as a result, the first players into the market, which were generally the medical players, all had they aside from having their indoor facilities, which truly doesn't make a lot of sense. Then every time they went into another state, they built another 20, 30, 50 million dollar facility. That's a lot of money to put into growing a plant indoors that has grown for thousands of years outdoors. And when you look at the cost structure, it's way more expensive to grow it indoors. Um, as a result, as soon as you can ship it across state lines. A lot of these big players that have invested a lot of money in these indoor cultivation facilities, I believe, are going to go bust. And I'll go so far as to say, if you wait four years, I think you're going to see that at least six of the top 10 multi-state operators won't exist anymore. And or if they do, it's going to be in a different state. It's going to be in a, a different configuration. And, and sorry to interrupt you there, but that was a yeah. point that you made on the phone the first time we spoke. And I believe your quote was that this is the year we're going to see a bunch of failures. And oh, yeah. I believe- well, I, I, last year, I, I was telling people 2022 would be the year of musical chairs. And there's a couple of investment banking guys in cannabis I know who called me back in the middle of the year. And they said, what do you mean by that? And I said, well, in Massachusetts, we've now got so many facilities open. And in the very beginning, some of the really big MSOs, it was a land grab. They wanted to get whatever they could. Like Cureleaf went into a tiny town in central Massachusetts called Ware, Massachusetts. It's a beautiful little town, but it's kind of like friends from where. Yeah. Word up. It's (laughs) where is it? Right. And and I remember the night they got in there uh, because I had a friend who had real estate out there. So we were trying to get a host community agreement and Cureleaf brought in an outside consultant, 
agreed to prepay $50,000 of their host community fee and donate a whole bunch of money to a local charity favored by one of the select board members. Um, they basically bought the license out in the open. And I couldn't understand why Curaleaf would want to be there. But at that point in time, everybody was nervous that they weren't going to get locations. Well, by 2022, the market was up. There was competition. It was no longer build it and they will come. If you had a crappy location, you probably weren't doing well. Um, and what I predicted was the big players were going to start to look at the crappy stores and trade out of the poor stores to get into better locations. We saw that with a multi-state operator that I think was the first one to close a store. They closed the store up in the North Shore in Lynn, Massachusetts, and moved their license to a medical-only store they had down that in was the Boston like, area. That was like within the last year. That was, that was it, like in the last year sometime, pretty that recently? That was in uh, early 22. Okay, yeah, cool. Sorry so to a interrupt. A little over you. a year ago, right? Mm. And that was the musical chairs I was talking about was operators who are going to realize that they wanted to trade out. And then I said, 2023 will be the year of failures because we'll have enough stores open that we're going to have some real competition. And then we're going to start to see that prices are going to compress because we had real expensive pricing around here. And when the prices compress, um, it, it's akin to something I saw happen in Texas, probably, I don't know, nine years ago. It's, People take out a lot of, they took out a lot of debt to drill oil wells. And when the price of oil went down, they needed to service the debt. So just hypothetically, if oil is a hundred bucks a barrel and it drops to $80 a barrel and you need to make a debt payment, then what you say is I got to produce 25% more oil to keep my revenue level so I can get enough money to pay my loan. But with all that extra oil coming on the market, then it drops to like $60 a barrel. So you got to pump even more oil. And it be, gets to the point where there was a point where oil was being given away in some of the markets because there were no takers for it. And cannabis won't get that bad. But with all the costs of indoor cultivation, my belief was as prices started to fall, instead of people closing up their facilities, they were just going to ramp up the production. And we've seen huge price compression in Massachusetts. And I don't think we're done. Mm. Green Market uh, Report had an article, I don't know, a month or so ago where they showed the average price wholesale per state. And I think Massachusetts was around $1,600 and change. And I think we were the most expensive about all the developed markets. And you mentioned this Green Market Report. Yep. Yeah. So... You know, all that bodes, that doesn't bode well for price stability. We're going to see prices come down even further and people who've got to pay their investors back, they'll get panicked and they're just going to try to crank out more flour. Hmm. So do you think that, um, you know, it, it seems like that this is, uh, and I, this is kind of a cheesy analogy to compare it to the gold rush, but it does seem like a lot of people are trying to stake their claim like, oh, we're going to go buy up all these facilities and then maybe haven't anticipated how much the price will compress or, or compress or, or maybe haven't um, maybe they've oversold what they're capable of producing or uh, maybe the quality of their product isn't that good. Have you, have you seen any of that in your work? I, I would say that I think there's a lot of that going around. I'll tell you what I've seen a lot of. I get into a discussion with because we was I was I, I I'm pretty well known in the social equity community because I did a lot of training and I did a lot of um, just offering my time as a coach and uh, and I would point out to people what are you going to do when the when you know when prices come down and I heard time and time again we're a craft cultivator so we're going to be okay because our stuff is going to be so much better people will pay a premium price so there was a point where Cumberland Farms the big convenience store chain. Uh, a few years ago, was going to try to push through a change in the alcohol licensing law because they wanted to be able to sell more beer and wine out of their stores. And they were limited to, a, I think it was maybe seven or nine licenses. And, um, and I wrote an article because in Massachusetts, the number of retail stores is tied to the number of carryout liquor licenses. So if Cumberland Farms got their way, we were going to see an explosion in the number of cannabis retail stores that would be available. And I did the analysis. The, I pub, the article was published in Commonwealth Magazine and Dig Boston and, uh, and I think Cannabis.net. And the Package Store Association picked it up 
And all of a sudden I went from not being able to get their attention to becoming the fair haired guy. So when I wanted to interview some wine retailers about it, uh, cause I think there's an intersection between wine and cannabis, they helped me out. And here's what I learned from the few wine retailers I interviewed. The high end of the wine market is only 3%. And it's usually bought for gifts and that type of thing. 70% of the wine market sells for under $15 a bottle. So if you think about that and, and you look at beer, and I didn't really do an analysis of beer, but I bet the regular run of the mill beers like Budweiser, Miller, that sort of thing, they probably command 70% of the market. And the higher end stuff, the craft stuff is probably, while there's a lot of different brands, you compare them to the sales of the big brands, all the craft together isn't a really major part of the market, which means if you say, well, Massachusetts could be a $2 billion market, so I'm comfortable that I'll get a premium price. Nah, you may only be selling into a $60 million slice of the market. And I think a lot of people haven't planned for that. Yeah. And it does seem, you know, this is a little anecdotal here, but last time I was in Boston walking around with my girlfriend, uh, you see all these beautiful new towers popping up. You see all this um, commercial real estate. And then some of them have the prices listed on the outside of flies like that's it seems expensive, although it's it's getting expensive here as well. But I I could imagine that if maybe you've overestimated um, the amount of output you can create and um, maybe paid a little too much for commercial real estate, that that could be a combination that kind of double squeeze. screws you. Yep, it's a very, very difficult squeeze. Yeah, now think about this. The city of Boston has more people living in it than the state of Vermont. <laughs> yep, yep. Right? <laughs> way, way more. Right, way more, even if you count the cows up there. <laughs> yep. Right? So, you know, it, it, um, we're opening up a retail store in downtown Boston across the street from South Station. And uh, that, that uh, 85, South Station is the busiest commuter hub in all New England. It's got buses, um, commuter rail, Amtrak comes through it, along with the MBTA hooks into it. Um, 85,000 people a day come through the place that's about 300 feet across the street from our store. And they're putting up a new, I think it's a 51-story tower over the tracks. It's going to have 768,000 square feet of office space, 200 hotel rooms, and I think 156 luxury condominiums, right? They, they just keep going with those. <laughs> it's just amazing. But for us, it's like, you know, all, all that we're paying a lot for the real estate, but we think we're in a good location. You know, everything is going to come down ultimately to a good location. I watch people just scramble to get into to industrial parks because that's where the town, the municipality would say, that's where we zoned it. You got to go into the industrial park because that's where we put strip joints, um, porn stores, and cannabis. And I'd be like, I don't want to be in the industrial park because give it a year or two when there's enough stores, nobody's going to want to go to the industrial park. And we're seeing that kind of stuff where all of a sudden it went from Build it and they will come to now location really matters. Which in real estate, see, isn't that the first rule? Location, location, yeah. location, location, right? Yeah. Mm. Mm. And and so, oh boy, I, I'd like to ask you a little bit about here. Let me let me see if I can pop this up here because you shared a couple of stories with me and this is uh, really out of my, my ballpark. I would like to talk to you a little bit about... Um, uh, real estate investment Timing is everything. Yeah. I was shredded for that article. I did that one in late April of 22 for, for and, people, uh, including myself. Could you explain what R E I T stands for? And could sure. you explain a little bit about how they function? Okay. A real estate and R E I T is, a, is a, called a re it's a real estate investment trust. And here's the way they work. Um, uh, a, a promoter forms the trust. They raise a whole bunch of money from investors, public, in this case, public investors. And then they take the money and they buy a property. And then they collect the rent. They take out their costs. And then the, the remaining proceeds, most of it gets sent back to the investors as dividends. And that's how real estate investment trusts generally work. 
There's several real estate investment trusts that service the cannabis industry. And the biggest one of all is a um, company called uh, stock symbol IIPR, Innovative Industrial Properties. And they, if you want to see a who's who in cannabis, you look at the client roster of IIPR. So, for example, if you bought a warehouse for $5 million and you're a big player, you go to IIPR and they'd probably say, okay, we'll give you the $5 million for the warehouse and then we're going to give you another $15 million so you can build it out. So now you got a $20 million warehouse that the only thing you can really use it for is cannabis because there's nothing else you can grow in that warehouse that is going to be valuable enough to justify a $20 million warehouse. And the problem is when they sell the building to IIPR and they lease it back, they lease it back under a long-term lease. So when cannabis prices eventually crash, and they will, what will happen is these big companies that are locked into all these big long-term leases for expensive cultivation properties are going to find that they don't have the money to service them. And there's uh, in, in um, cannabis, we've got this thing called 280E. It's a one sentence, 77 word provision of the federal tax code that says, if you're dealing with a controlled substance under schedule one or schedule two of the controlled substance act, <coughs> And let's say you don't have a DEA license, which you're not going to have on Schedule 1. I'm not sure about Schedule 2. Then you don't get to deduct most of your expenses. You get to deduct cost of goods sold and that's it. So you end up paying huge amounts of taxes. So let's say you've got a $30 million cultivation facility and you're producing marijuana in that facility. You get to deduct a lot of the costs involved because they're related to the cost of the product. As soon as you idle that plant, you got to keep paying the lease, but the way things are right now, you can't deduct that rent payment because you're not producing anything there. And I think as we begin to see some large players, when interstate commerce comes into play, realize that they can't produce the product cost effectively and they go to idle those plants, they're going to have to keep paying on the, the rent on the leases and they're going to find that rent's not tax deductible, which is going to be a double whammy. It's going to be very expensive for them. That's why I don't believe, uh, if you look at the list of the top 10 publicly traded MSOs, I wouldn't be surprised if six of them aren't around in four or five years. And, and could you tell us exactly what you meant when you posed the question, uh, when will the IIPR canary fall? Sure. I assume that has something well, to do with bad real estate investments. So that was uh, a company called, I think it's Blue Orca Capital, had written an article about um, they think that uh, IIPR was is is, a, is in trouble because Parallel, um, who is known as New England Treatment Net Netter up in the Parallel. Boston area or in Massachusetts. Uh, oh, that was a uh, Bo Wrigley. He had a Bo Wrigley's of company of of Wrigley chewing gum fame, right? He, of that family. So um, they a Parallel apparently last year wasn't paying some of their rent, if I recall. I mean, I. I don't recall the everything in the article exactly, but I'm pretty sure it was parallel. So Blue Orca was, was latching on to the fact that uh, um, IIPR had some softness in their portfolio. And, and, and here we go. And well, they were I'll, looking I'll, at parallel, I'll, like parallel was the, like the canary in the coal mine. And my, I wrote this article after that. And what I said is what they missed is parallel is not the canary in the coal mine. IIPR is the canary in the coal mine. And you watch when IIPR stock starts falling, that means that a lot of the big tenants aren't paying rent. Their stock, I think, a, a while ago was $200 a share. And I, I don't know what it is right now, but I bet it's well under 100. In fact, because we have technology, I'll look it up. But no, I, I was going to yeah. do it right now. Go ahead, at, give it a shot. Let's see it's what you're at come 69.96. Right. And look at what was the like the, 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 the 24 month high on oh, that. Oh, shit peaked out in uh, November, somewhere around November 2021. It was up around 250. There you go. So think about that. 250 wow, so in November 21. In less than two years, they've lost 75% of their value? 70%? Wow. Right, so, yeah. Yeah, I would yep. guess. That, wow. 70, 75% of their value, right? Wow. So if IIPR shares start going down, which they my are. theory like. is... They are the canary in the coal mine because that means that the biggest players in the market are having trouble paying their rent. 
And if you recall, you asked me about my background in the very beginning. I told you I'd spent, you know, 20 odd years in the equipment leasing industry. The diff there's some differences between leasing real estate and leasing equipment, but at the heart, it's still an, a commercial lease. And when somebody falls behind on, equi on an equipment lease, you work with them to restructure the lease. You got them in, their, in, in your delinquent pool because they're not paying their rent. But let's say they're four months behind on their rent and you restructure the deal. You take the back rent, you roll it in, you extend the term, maybe drop the payments. As soon as they make their first payment, you consider them current. Mm. So, so this so is similar. you look at IIPR, once they rewrite the lease, all of a sudden the customer is back to being current. I started an analysis that I didn't finish of trying to look at IP, IIPR to see what percentage of their leases they've rewritten. Because <clears throat> it's not a case of these companies are stumbling once. It's prices went down, price compression happened, they stumbled. If price compression continues to happen, they're going to stumble again. And, and when I, as IIPR stock goes down, to me, that's the barometer of the health of the really big players. And if you follow somebody like, um, um, oh, now I can't think of, of, I got a mental block. Yeah, Alan, Alan Brockstein, he's out of Texas and he sends out a newsletter every Sunday of, of tracking the publicly traded stocks. And the, stock, the, the pools of stocks they track are just been slammed and they don't seem to want to recover. Why? Right? Those are generally the larger public companies. And none of them are doing well. How, how many properties do you think IIPR uh, owns throughout the cannabis industry in the United States? I forget, but it's well over 100. I yeah. mean, I, I was I was starting to read all of their public filings back around early this year, probably January. And I got a folder on my computer of a research project I wanted to do. But, you know, you have to be in the in, right mood. And you have to have plenty of time when you want to do that. And, and that's in a bunch of different states? Oh, you know, they're all over the country, right? California, Colorado, Massachusetts, they cater to the big players. Mm. And where they used to sit back rather arrogantly and say, our clients aren't going to default. And even if they did, we'd find somebody else who would snap up that facility in a heartbeat. Now you read their documents and they say, you know, when our clients default, hopefully we can release it, but we may not be able to release it to somebody in the cannabis space. In fact, we not, may not be able to release it at all. On the, on the um, finance site, Seeking Alpha, a few months ago, somebody did an analysis of IIPR. And what they looked at was the base price of the properties versus how much IIPR had paid for them. And that's like I was talking about, you buy a $5 million warehouse, and then they give you $5 million for the warehouse and another $15 million or so to trick it out. And this fellow had done a pretty good analysis. And what he was pointing out was, as these cannabis companies, if they go bust, <clears throat> what does IIPR have? Real estate is generally thought to be great collateral, but it's great collateral when you can redeploy it. If what you have is a specialized warehouse built for indoor production of a high volume of a highly valuable crop <clears throat> that loses its value, what are you going to do? Somebody who's going to use that warehouse doesn't need epoxy floors. Somebody who's going to use that warehouse doesn't need all the expensive lighting you put in. And somebody who's going to use that warehouse probably doesn't need all the expensive AC, which means when somebody else comes in and they say, yeah, I'll rent the warehouse, they're not going to rent it for a high premium price. They're going to say, you got a 30,000 square foot warehouse. I need it as a warehouse, right? Or I need it as like a light manufacturing facility. I'm not paying you for all these lights I don't need, all this HVAC I don't need and these super fancy floors. And that's where I think the losses will come in. Right, and the energy inputs uh, into growing indoor cannabis certainly seem substantial. Uh, in Vermont, uh, we got some of the highest electrical rates in the country, I believe. And and, and some of I've seen some of my friends' electric bills, and it shit is scary. There, there was, a couple of years ago, there was an estimate that 10 over 10% of the commercial electricity consumption in Massachusetts was being consumed by cannabis companies. Right. So think about how environmentally bad that is. That's wild. I would have assumed it would have been hospitals or like um, Raytheon or something. You know, it's the cannabis growers. You know, they're wow. just going through tons and tons of electricity growing indoors. And remember, if the, for the run of the mill product, when somebody can grow it outdoors in at 
hundreds and hundreds, if not a few thousand acres, right? Big industrial farmers in the Midwest, if they've got the right climate for it, or in the Northwest, somebody's going to find the right climate and say, you know, we grow this stuff by the acre and we, we're doing what we need to do. And maybe they're using some natural ways for pest control, right? We live on a pond. That means we're going to have a lot of mosquitoes. So we're planting all different plants that mosquitoes don't like to keep the mosquitoes away, right? Um, apparently, if you plant marigolds near certain plants, while we can't, my sister was explaining this to me the other day, while humans can't smell certain things, they put off a scent that animals don't like, so the animals won't come and eat your pumpkins, that sort of thing. Cool. You know, there, there are home, home, more natural ways of managing it than like Roundup and all these really toxic chemicals. And mm -hmm. some farmers are going to start to research that, grow some pretty good outdoor cannabis, use some other natural plants to keep the bugs away, and then it's going to be game over for a lot of the indoor growers. I, there's definitely going to be a market for people who are going to be willing to pay the premium. But remember, that's not going to be a big slug of the market. And I would imagine Massachusetts, right? Like the, you know, the east side is uh, Boston. It's mostly city. I would imagine like if you wanted to grow outdoor, uh, Western Mass would, would be the place. It seems Absolutely. kind of like Southern Vermont. Yeah. You know, and, and I got into a debate with somebody in 2019 at the NCIA show in Boston. And I was arguing that um, you should grow, if you're going to grow outdoors, grow in a greenhouse. And this fellow's telling me how I don't know what I'm talking about because you can't grow all year round. And I said, yeah, but in a greenhouse, you're going to have such lower uh, um, power consumption. You're going to need a fan in there. And maybe that's about it. And you'll probably make more money growing from late April or May through October and skipping the grow from November to, through March or April than somebody who's growing indoors all year round. Hmm. Right. Do you, Caleb, do you like apples? Interesting point there, David. You like apples? Yeah, I do. You, do you eat them in the wintertime? <laughs> I try to get to seasonal shit. So back when I was in the equipment leasing industry, we, we uh, almost financed a bunch of equipment for uh, a local apple orchard. So I had to go out and, and my job was get out, meet the customer and learn about the business. And here's what I learned about the apple business. When they harvest the apples, the really good apples go to like Harry and David's and folks like that that make fruit baskets. The stuff that falls on the ground that they really can't use, they throw that in and they mash it up and they turn it into apple juice. And then the run of the mill apples, the, the good stuff will get maybe make apple pies out of it, sell it to supermarkets. The apples that are not quite ripe, they put into cold, dark warehouses they, they pump through ni with nitrogen. Now you're breathing right now, right, Caleb? What? Yeah, yeah. So what you're breathing in is about 70% nitrogen, about 20.9% oxygen, and the rest is a whole bunch of other inert gases. And anybody who scuba dives, that's one of the first things that you learn. So what they, what they would do in the warehouse is they pump it through a, with a lot of nitrogen, so it's very little oxygen in there. The apples go into a state of suspended animation with no light and no oxygen. And then when they get an order from the supermarket, they pull up one of these bins full of apples, leave it out in the regular air. It ripens up really quick and they ship it off to the supermarket. Right. I, I guess I've, I've never heard that. Yeah. But I'm, yep. yeah, I'm listening. So we, we're going to get to the point where we're going to be growing cannabis. Let's say in upstate New York where they grow wines for wineries. Cause I, my, my limited understanding and do not take my word on anything having to do with the plant. I understand the, the industry and some of the strategies and the finance and the industry construct, I am definitely not a person to rely on for the plant itself. But Neither. I'm a customer. Grow it, let's say you can grow it really well in upstate New York. If you upstate New York is beautiful. It's nothing like Manhattan. It's like going through the Midwest. Lots of farm country. You drive Route 20 out to like Syracuse. It's beautiful out there. Mm. People are going to grow it on acres and acres of land and you're not going to get a cheaper price and they're going to be able to grow it there. And the indoor growers are going to have a hard time competing. Um, and even if they can only grow it between April and October outdoors, I think they're going to make more money than the people who've got a $30 million indoor grow facility.
that they got to use lighting indoors, they got to use HVAC, and right. they got to pay for the lease on that thirty million dollar facility. Right. You might not be um, you might not be producing a product you could sell for as much, but your energy inputs are way less, your costs are way less. So you know, yeah. um, boy, that's an important balance. Right. And, and who sells more beer, Budweiser or Sam Adams? Or harpoon, right? Doesn't uh, doesn't Boston? Oh, I thought uh, I thought it was the same company. Didn't uh, Anheuser Busch buy them up? Maybe. Uh, yeah, somebody may have bought one of them. I don't no, track the beer market. But. I was gonna say Ma Magic Hat got bought up by Anheuser Busch. They, <laughs> they sell yep. a ton of. Beer. I assume Budweiser sells the most beer of any brand, uh, yep. just by volume. And, and yeah, maybe it's not the best beer, but it's cheap and people like it. Yeah, I think you have a great point there, David. Yep. Mm. I one thing I wanted to ask you about was you talked about these publicly traded companies, and this is something that um, I've talked a, a lot about with a number of people. Um, how is it possible for uh, people to be public uh, cannabis companies to be publicly traded when it's still federally illegal? Do you do you know anything about that? Yeah, they're trading a lot of them are trading up on the Toronto Stock Exchange. So that's how they do it, huh? Yeah. And it's legal, so federally, uh, federally legal in Canada. Right. Well, it's like credit cards, right? You talk to, you, it, in general, you can't, you're not supposed to use a credit card in a cannabis store. It's illegal. But there's plenty of people who found workarounds. There's a couple of consultants and a CEO that found a workaround at ease and they went to jail for it. Um, really? And I've, I've talked to folks in that business. And uh, in fact, I wrote a couple articles about cashless ATMs and and they would say, well, we've got we've got the code. So I did some checking on that, on the merchant code that Visa publishes and they have a code for cannabis, but it's where it's legal. So I had a guy tell me, well, it's legal in our state. And I said, that's Visa is not regulated at the state level. They're regulated at the federal level. What they mean is where it's federally legal, like up in Canada, right? So there's a lot of things you can do in Canada because it's federally legal that you can't do down in the States. Right. But don't you think a lot of that money is probably coming back to the United States? Well, what, what you mean? Like, because the public companies. Yeah, sure. Like yeah, it's being you know, traded. I assume a lot of those investors are Americans. Somehow. Absolutely. Right. Hmm. You got an, it, you've got an, a company with American operations that's up in Canada um, on this co Toronto stock exchange with American investors. The whole thing is really nuts right it, it the federal government the, the cannabis was not illegal in the united states it's that you had to have a tax stamp from the 1937 marijuana tax act and uh and that fell apart in 1969 when uh ever hear of um timothy leary <laughs> strangely enough i have david <laughs> right so timothy leary was a harvard trained psychologist packs up his family in the mid to late sixties. They go for a trip down to Mexico. They go over the, they go past the U S border guards, get to the Mexican border guards. They, some of their papers aren't in line and they get turned back to the U S they get to the U S and the U S border guards say, we got to check your bags. And Larry says, no, 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 you don't understand. We just went down there and they turned us away. And the Americans said, you don't understand. You went past. And if you're coming back in, we check your bags. So I think it was in Leary's daughter's bag. They found a few joints whereupon they get arrested. Leary is found guilty, appeals that he's found guilty. He appeals to the United States Supreme Court that takes up the case. And in 1969, the Supreme Court of the United States ruled unanimously that uh, the 1937 Marijuana Tax Act was unconstitutional for a real interesting reason. In order to get a marijuana tax stamp, which was very expensive, right? It cost a hundred bucks, I think, an ounce to get the to, to get the stamp. A brand new Studebaker um, family sedan sold for six hundred fifty dollars. So a hundred for a tax stamp versus mm -hmm. six fifty for a car. But to get that, you had to admit that you had cannabis. And if you're in a state where is it it was illegal, you would be admitting to a crime. And Leary argued it violated his Fifth Amendment right against self incrimination. Supreme Court agreed cannabis became legal in the United States temporarily. And President Nixon responded with the the um, the the um, Controlled Substance Act or the Comprehensive Drug Act of 1970, 
of which one title was the Controlled Substance Act that made it illegal again. And I forget sure. how I get down that particular rabbit hole. <laughs> I I also did, but I got I got some more stuff here. I got plenty of stuff here, David. Um, sure. What, one of the other things that you mentioned for sure was the um, the interstate commerce. And um, in, in this article, you definitely talked about um, the dormant commerce clause. And I was wondering yes. if you could explain that for us, please. The dormant commerce clause is a theory that states that you can't restrict trade between the states. The United States has the greatest economy in the world right now. And we've had the greatest economy for a long time. One of the reasons is the way it's designed. So we have all these independent states, but you can't erect basically a toll booth on the border between Massachusetts and Vermont and say, you can't bring your milk down here from Vermont. You can say, if you're going to sell milk in Massachusetts, it's got to have the following testing and the following quality and the following labeling requirements. But if somebody up in Vermont can meet that, those requirements, they get to sell their milk down here. In cannabis, all the state laws are designed to say you can only grow it in state and sell it in state. And we're seeing federal courts across the country slowly state that the dormant commerce clause does in fact apply to cannabis. And if the dormant commerce clause applies to cannabis, then interstate commerce is right around the bend. <clears throat> Massachusetts is going through a regulatory review period. They'll finish it, I believe, on November 8th, November 8th and November 9th. And um, I submitted a petition for a whole bunch of items. And I got a call from the senior counsel of the Cannabis Control Commission. And on two of my petitions, one of them, they said, look, we can't do anything. You have to go through the state legislature. And it has to do with on the medical side in Massachusetts, you have to be fully integrated. And there's a push to try to deintegrate it. So you could have a standalone medical marijuana store and not have to grow it and process it and manufacture it as well as home delivery. Um, the, having one of those moments where I just lost my train of thought. Sorry about that, folks. Um, we're talking about the, 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 yeah, oh, the commerce. Interstate the dormant commerce. commerce clause, right? So under the, what, the, what the feds have been saying is the dormant commerce clause applies to cannabis, which means you can't, you're not going to, oh, I was talking about the, 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 um, the petitions. One of the petitions I submitted was on interstate commerce. And I got a call from the senior council that said, look, we can't do anything on this petition to try to break up the medical licensing to deintegrate it. You got to go find a legislator to file a bill. And on the interstate commerce, we've already got it on our radar, on our agenda, which to me means they're going to do something about building interstate commerce into the regs. It was interesting when I said, no, nah, I'll just leave the petition there. They said, do you mind if we share the petition with the commissioners? So I, there's something that about what I wrote about how to approach it that the senior counsel of the Cannabis Control Commission must have thought was interesting enough to want to share it with the petitioners, which leads me to believe that by November, we're going to see regulations that have some proviso for interstate commerce. And once those regulations come out, there's like a 30 day period where I think people can challenge your appeal and then goes to the secretary of state and then they become final. So sometime in December, I think Massachusetts is going to have provisions for interstate commerce. And once that first transaction gets done, I think the floodgates are going to open. And that, yes. I think, is going to become the demise of a lot of players who put a lot of money into indoor cultivation. And I, I saw something out in New Jersey recently where they uh, passed something that's supposedly supposed to decouple um, 280E from cannabis businesses, which seems yep. like, especially in the retail situation, um, would, would be actually incredibly beneficial to a lot of retail owners. I think it's going to be beneficial to everybody, right? But it's only going to be limited beneficial. Remember, the, most of the taxes you pay out of the federal government, state taxes tend to be much smaller. So if you're in a state like, let's say, New Jersey, where I think the tax rate is somewhere around, I'm just guessing, but let's say it's 8%. But with the feds, you could be paying three times that amount. Getting decoupled from 280E will save you a little bit of money at the state level, but nowhere near what it would at the federal level. 
And it seems like, yeah, for people that are just trying to get off the ground, you know, that could be a huge uh, savings for them, especially. Oh, that'll um, be huge. And one thing I wanted to ask you a little bit about was about um, getting accesses to uh, loans and financing or maybe your thoughts on the Safe Banking Act. I don't know if you're familiar with that. The but, Safe um, Banking? Yeah, sure. Or, yeah, or just, just like people's inability. Yeah. I don't know of anybody who's in this industry that doesn't have a bank to do. I'm sorry, a depository institution, whether it's a credit union or a savings bank or a commercial bank. Massachusetts, it's not hard to find a bank to open up an account at. And it's the same in other states that you may not be able to find a bank in every town, but every state has banks that are servicing the industry. So the depository side, yeah, you know, I don't think safe banking is going to do a lot. But if and I haven't read the Safe Banking Act, but if it what would be great for safe banking if it protects the credit card companies, because that will allow the credit card companies to say, OK, we'll start to give merchant accounts to cannabis operators. That's going to save a lot of money, and it's going to mean now you're going to be able to accept credit cards. As soon as you accept credit cards, the average sale, the average basket increases. I, I did read the Safe Banking Act, and it does seem like it provides, it, it says it right on page one, it's going to provide protections for financial institutions, so they're not liable for it. And it does seem like that would be one of the big benefits is, because right. I see in Vermont right now, everyone's cash only, cash only. Yeah. Um, and as soon as they can take credit cards, I imagine that's going to make their lives a, a lot easier. That's going to be huge because while everybody's like, oh, we need banking, we need banking. A, we already have banking. Right. And B, right. which everybody seems to forget, for nine years, banking has been fine with the feds. There's, a, there's something called FinCEN, the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network. On February 14th, 2014, the federal government issued two guidance memos. For people who've heard of this thing called the Cole Memo, there's actually three of them. The third memo came out Valentine's Day 2014, hand in hand with guidance from FinCEN. And the FinCEN guidance was basically an operating manual for depository institutions where FinCEN said, if you're going to bank marijuana companies that are state legal, this is the way we want you to do it. So you're supposed to file a, a suspicious activity report every time a deposit's made. If you think that they're in compliance with state law and there's nothing wrong, note that at the top of the report so we don't spend a lot of time on it. And if you think there's something we need to look into, then put it, note that as well so we'll know which one of these SARS, suspicious activity reports, we should actually pay attention to. But that guidance is available. If somebody wants to see it, just Google FinCEN Banking, February 14th, 2014, it'll pull it right up for you. So it's not so much the depository institutions that, that, that will hopefully come aboard with safe banking. It's maybe there'll be some lending because lending right now is very painful and very expensive. And what will be a big help on the retail side is credit cards, right? There's all kinds of problems on the lending side. You, you, um, if you're lending to a cannabis company, the biggest asset they probably have on a retail store is their inventory vault. And how are you going to take a collateral position in the inventory if you can't hold it and you can't resell it because you don't have a license? Which means uh -huh. that we need a whole new license class of this thing called collateral agents that uh -huh. could allow somebody to come in on behalf of a bank, seize the collateral and sell the collateral off of the bank to make it something that a bank can take as collateral. Huh. With a with a depreciating asset, <laughs> right, right, a perishable asset, right. Everybody forgets you. You know, if you don't sell an apple within a certain period of time, you better turn it into applesauce because they're not going to last forever. Even, unless, even if you put them into a warehouse pump full of nitrogen, eventually food goes bad. The only food that doesn't go bad is honey. That's the only food that will last forever. Beyond that, everything's got a shelf life. Same with cannabis. <laughs> uh, David, I got a couple more and we touched on this a little bit, but I was really hoping like uh, I've talked to a bunch of people about this and people ask me to ask you about it is these lease agreements where you set up a company and lease your own shit to yourself. Yep. And I really was wondering if you could explain the mechanics of, of those kind of things. <laughs> and uh, Maybe someone listening here in Vermont might save some money or something. 
So there's two issues with that. One issue is how do you get money out of a closely held company? And one way is you set up a separate company, you buy all the equipment and you lease it to the operating company. There's sometimes there's some reasons for doing that that have to do with asset protection. Trucking companies are famous for setting up companies that will hold all the trucks and then lease the trucks to the operating company such that if there is ever a bad collision, like a truck truck driver has a heart attack and drives into a school bus and a lot of people get killed, when the trucking company gets sued, the leasing company doesn't get sued and you don't lose all your equipment, which means, regrettably, the trucking company can file bankruptcy, but the owners can form another trucking company, release all the equipment. Huh. We don't have that kind of liability. So th these deals aren't set up for that same kind of liability protection. They're set up more for if you've got 280E and you buy a whole bunch of equipment and you want to make sure that you can ratchet up as much of your costs as possible. If it's production equipment that you're leasing to the company, that should be um, an allowable expense under 280E. So you buy the equipment Let's say you took out a bank loan and you're paying the bank $1,000 a month, but you lease it to your company and they're paying $1,600 a month. They may be able to deduct the full $1,600 and then you're getting the money from that company. And unless you get audited, the feds may not look at that your leasing company is receiving trafficking proceeds and therefore being subject to 280E and it's a tax strategy. Right. And, and it's, which they said they were not going to aggressively pursue those types of cases in states that had um, decided to go ahead and legalize cannabis. It's it, I mean, not to say I trust those kind of statements, but it did sound like, yeah, if you're in a legal state, we're not really going to look at a ton of the. Um, or, well, that or, has to do with the enforcement on the um, on the 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 like the DEA side or the FBI, that type of thing. That's not the IRS side of things. Hmm. Right. I just Department assumed. of Justice is different from the Department of Treasury. I Remember, just Al Capone didn't go to crime for all the crimes, didn't go to jail for all the horrible crimes he committed. He went to jail for tax evasion. Fair, fair. Right? Yeah. So they yeah. came up with this 280E thing to go after drug traffickers. Well, if we can't catch you trafficking the drugs, what we'll do is we'll catch you for tax evasion. Mm. And we'll make it really bad by saying you can't deduct most of your costs. It, it seems, you know, in, in my opinion, anyway, I try to keep my opinion out for the most part, but it seems like discrimination against cannabis company owners in terms of oh. the insurance fees and the banking fees, the deposit fees, all this shit. Well, it's, it seems like they're singling out no. cannabis company owners. Absolutely. Because it's, it's, it's a more difficult industry because it's illegal at the federal level and legal at the state level. And then it was put on schedule one by, by Nixon temporarily until they could figure it out. So anybody who remembers the 2016 presidential election in the U S we had all of this issue about Russian interference and they brought in um, Mueller who, who, who wrote this big report that got published and people who were interested in the, the 2016 election bought that report as a book to read it. Well, back in the early seventies, the former governor of Pennsylvania was looking to become a federal judge. And Richard Nixon said to Ray Schaefer, I want you to head a commission and I want you to put the nail in the coffin on marijuana and prove unequivocally once and for all, this thing is horrible. And Ray Schaefer being an honest guy took it to heart and he spent a year and I think he had like 73 people on staff and a budget of Oh, I don't know, like $50 million. And they went around the country. They took testimony. They conducted studies. They watched people consume. And after a year, they came out with a 1,184-page report. And I don't remember the exact quotes, but the gist of it was, this is a big to-do about nothing. We should not just, de we, we should just decriminalize it. And, and for people who are selling small amounts like street dealers, that shouldn't be a crime anymore. Nixon was so pissed off, threw the report away, said to the public, we know it's dangerous, so we're going to ignore the report, and Ray Schaefer never got his appointment to the federal bench. The federal government has been lying to the American public for so many years that people just believe it's got to be bad. 
when there's all the evidence points to the fact it isn't bad at all. Mm. The FDA in the 1970s established the Compassionate Use Drug Program where they were making joints at the University of Mississippi and giving them to select patients who had things like glaucoma. Why? Because it was helping with a lot of medical issues. 1989, a federal judge, DEH, administrative law judge named Francis Young, issued an opinion that the scheduling of marijuana as a Schedule One drug was arbitrary and capricious, and that marijuana was probably one of the safest compounds known to man. The Bush One administration sat on that. I believe that's who was in office at the time and quietly killed it on like Saturday, December 30th, when nobody would pay any attention to it. But you begin to look at history. The federal government has lied to the public about marijuana for a long time. It, it doesn't seem like that's um, stopping. Right. So <laughs> when the feds, and I don't think the feds are going to budge on it. I think all the movement is going to come out of lawsuits in the courts. Like what happened up with, um, um, uh, I think it's National Patri Patients Group out of Maine when they sued the state of Maine. And a federal judge came down and said, they're right, the state's wrong. And uh, and then it went up to the federal appellate court who said, we agree, plaintiff wins, and the dormant commerce clause applies to cannabis. I remember interviewing a guy about that case from Maine. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Uh -huh. oh, it's good stuff, David. <laughs> <laughs> I really, um, I want to know um, specifically also, um, I, before I forget to, I, I noticed you also hosted a podcast. I got that in my notes. Um, but uh, what I'd really like to know is specifically, so, so say you've got yourself into a bad real estate deal and you yep. find yourself way in over your head. What are your options for restructuring debt? Like how, how many different, uh, like how does it work? I have no idea, um, but I'd so, like to know what your options are when you find yourself in that position. You got to do some role playing with yourself. And you got to say, what if I actually own that building? What would my options be? Now, if you're in a brand new market like New Jersey, New York, Maryland, lots of people are going to rush in and the landlord's be going to be able to say, I'll just lease it to some other idiot who comes along. But if you're in a more mature market like Massachusetts and the landlord realizes the growers are having problems, it isn't just you who's having trouble. It's the whole market is having trouble. Now, all of a sudden, you got to look at what are their options. And if you've got a landlord that isn't going to be able to easily release that building, or they're going to have to put a whole bunch of money to rip out the lights and change the HVAC and tear down everything you did in that building, it may cost them money to put another tenant in there. And if that's the case and you analyze it, you just need to figure out what's the landlord's options. And if you can show them that the option of working out a deal with you and and modifying your rent is a better option for them, you're likely going to end up with a better deal. But it's really not looking at what you need. It's looking at what your counterparty's options are, what they need, and what they might be able to get in the open market. I think I told you about a store up in Lynn that I was looking to buy from an MSO, one of the first ones that closed up, right? That deal went on for probably seven or eight months before it died in December of last year. And the reason it died was the, these guys had like a 2000 square foot store and they were paying up to $25,000 a month in rent. That's what killed them. Yeah. Well, the landlord didn't want to get realistic on the rent. And I kept telling the landlord, I'm not going to make the same mistake. If we can't get the rent realistic, you're, I know what the market is for rent up in that area. You're not going to get it. And if you think just because it's cannabis, we're going to pay a premium, we're not going to pay that premium. I don't know if they've released the space or not, but they've got a space up there that um, a beautiful space, but it's tricked out for a cannabis store. How many other stores do you know need the man trap in the front to check the ID before you can go in mm. that have to have the secure vault, right? Right. Yeah, the setup is very like unique, kind of. You're right. So, that so you were gonna buy, you were gonna buy up this um, MSO spot that went out of business. Right, we were gonna buy up the spot. We cut a good deal with the MSO, and the final piece was the landlord. And the landlord just couldn't get over the fact that the MSO 
had defaulted under the lease. And what they wanted was we, we had cut a deal. I forget it like tentatively. We were going to pay a high number. Maybe it was like six grand a month, but they would only give us a two year lease. And when I said, I'm not doing this for two years, we'll get all our bills paid off and then you'll t- you'll throw us out. I needed no renewals. And they were like, OK, well, then you can renew it. You'll go from six thousand. The next year will be seven thousand. The next year will be eight. And the next year will be nine. I was like, you guys are on drugs. The place isn't even worth six grand. All the broker price opinions we had collected indicated it was probably worth maybe four thousand dollars a month. We were willing to pay a premium to get the deal done, but we weren't going to start paying double or triple what the place was worth. You think they were trying to tax you so they could pay off some of their old debts? <laughs> no, they had bought the building. They had, they bought a four thousand square foot building. Then they put all the money up to to remodel it. And when it was remodeled, they did a beautiful job, but they took out most of the second floor. So when you walked into the sales floor, you could see all the way up to the ceiling in this beautiful old brick building. But now a 3,900 square foot building became a 2,148 square foot building. So now if you're going to lease that building out to the next guy, they're going to say, well, how much per square foot times 2,148 square feet? not times the 3,900 square feet that you guys bought the building at. So they were in a bad situation and they wanted somebody to come bail them out. And I wasn't in the insurance business of paying off other people's losses. So we couldn't get a deal put together. Mm. But that goes to your question, right? What I tried to do was tell them, I I got broker price opinions as to what the property is likely going to be worth if you don't have a cannabis operator in there. And then you need to look at what you're going to have to pay to remodel it for somebody else's use. And when you throw all this in, guys, here's what we're, we'll pay you a premium. But this is all we're, we're not willing to pay the floor of 12 five with the with, And if our sales go up, it goes to 25,000. Unless you're going to tell us we'll come in, we'll pay all the, the taxes, the insurance, the upkeep costs. And you start our rent at like a buck a month and we'll pay you based upon our sales level. And then we'll give you some upside. But they wanted to have us pay a high rent and have more upside. Not We weren't willing to do that. Are, are there deals that are structured like that where, hey, um, the more money, the more weed you sell, the more you're going to pay us for rent? Absolutely. But usually they start, They have a really high floor. So the landlord's going to kill it. And then when all of a sudden, so if you buy weed at 10 bucks and you sell it for 20, you got a 50% margin and you make $10 in every sale. If all of a sudden you start buying your weed at $8 and you sell it at 16, you still got a 50% margin. But now instead of making $10 every time you sell one of those items, you're making eight. But imagine if the if the price, instead of starting at 20, the market drops and maybe it goes down, the retail price goes down to 12 because we've had huge margin compression or price compression. <clears throat> so now every time that customer walks in, instead of giving you $20 and you say, great, I made 10, they're giving you 12 and you're making six and you still got to carry the, you got to co- cover the cost of your utilities. You got to cover the cost of a whole bunch of things. So if you don't sell to more customers, even on the retail side, price compression can be a problem. Yeah. And it's not like the price of anything else is going down. Right. <laughs> Just the products you're selling. <laughs> Um, there was one other question that I had in here, and that is a question of uh, receivership. I'm wondering what you know about receivership. So interestingly enough, can- <coughs> cannabis companies cannot file bankruptcy. If you're a landlord to a cannabis company, you likely can't file bankruptcy. And here's why. The bankruptcy court won't consider illegal proceeds to confirm a bankruptcy plan. So let's say you have a, you own a building and you're leasing it out and um, a fourth of the building you're leasing to a cannabis company, things get into trouble and you have to file bankruptcy. The bankruptcy court will consider the other 75% of the building that you have rented to non-cannabis companies, but they won't consider the rent you receive from the cannabis company because that's considered trafficking proceeds. If the cannabis company is your only tenant, You can't file for bankruptcy. And if you're a cannabis company and you file for bankruptcy, the case will be dismissed. So your only option is to go into state receivership. And the receiver basically applies to the local 
licensing authority, like the Cannabis Control Commission, gets permission from them and then takes control as a receiver of the business and then figures out a way to either liquidate it or sell it. We had our first receivership successfully done by Opus Consulting and Burns and Levinson, the law firm in Boston. They sold uh, uh, a failed medical marijuana operator to Merrimack. But that's what receivership is about. Yeah. And so that's usually like lawyers, right? They will come in and like take over control. Yeah, lawyers or, or, or numbers jockeys like I am. Yeah. <laughs> right deal people transactional folks hmm. I, I just want to ask you before we get out of here david um maybe you could tell and i feel like you've probably mentioned a couple of these things already but like i i'd like to close on a note of like give some people some pointers for how they can stay out of this kind of trouble that you help well i don't want to talk you out of a job either but like how can people avoid making these bad deals and, and um you know, set themselves up for success. All right. So we're opening up a store in Boston, right across the street from South Station, busiest commuter hub in all of New England, 85,000 people a day come through there. We're, we're directly across the street from the entrance to the bus depot, 125 feet, diagonally across the street from the entrance to the commuter rail platform, 300 feet away, and probably about 200 feet away from this new 51 story tower that's going in. We got a great store with a phenomenal location. We think it's going to be one of the top 10 um, locations in the state. Had somebody come in and quote us on our millwork, and they told us, expect for all the millwork, the cabinets and the display cases, you're going to spend about $85,000 to $130,000. We found a jewelry store that was moving in West Warwick, Rhode Island. We bought all of their jewelry cases for three grand. We've had to pay some storage fees. Then we brought them to a furniture refinisher who's refinished them and it'll probably cost us for the first group of them, I bet about seven or $8,000. When we're all in, we're gonna be into it for maybe 20, maybe. And then on top of that, we're not gonna need all the cases. We're gonna, we've already talked to somebody in New York who, who wanna buy the rest of them. I bet we'll have our display cases done for 15,000. We went onto Facebook Marketplace, and when Olympia Sports was closing all their stores, we went to one of the local stores, and I spent a day and a half in their inventory room taking down where, racking systems. For about four, about $1,000, we bought so much um, inventory racks that for our, our, our inventory room, we're going to have a ton of stuff, and we'll have extra that we'll be able to sell. But we're not we're not paying the the price of new racks. We bought it new. We bought it used. My recommendation: if you're going into retail, start looking for used deals. Every time a store closes in Massachusetts that I hear about, since we're not open yet, I try to get in touch with them and say, "What are you going to do with your security system? We'd be we'd love to buy your cameras, your monitors, that sort of thing. And if you can buy it used, buy it used because once you get it into your store and you've been operating for six months. You will find no matter what you do, you're going to have scuff marks, scratches, that type of thing on your cases. Nothing's going to look perfectly and the customers aren't going to mind. It's got to look good. It doesn't have to be absolutely brand new. Cut your costs up front. Start to look at Facebook Marketplace, Craigslist, look around and find used assets that you can deploy. It doesn't have to be new and find ways to cut your costs. We're going to have a, a store in one of the most expensive locations. And I bet when we open this store up, it will be the second least expensive store that will have opened in the state. Get your costs down. Because if your costs are low, you can survive a lot longer if you run into turbulence. Mm -hmm. Second thing, make sure you don't do something stupid with your real estate lease. That's going to be the boat anchor. And if the landlord is trying to, if you're down in a hot market and the landlord's got 30 takers, for one space, it's going to drive the price up. Don't say, well, this is what we got to pay. Go yell at your regulators. Google my name, read some of the articles that I've published and, and make the argument that they need to come up with ways that you shouldn't have to have your real estate to get licensed. Because if you've got a community like Natick, Massachusetts, that was going to allow two stores, but they would probably had maybe eight locations where those two stores could go and they got 48 to 50 parties interested, those eight landlords, if you don't take it, somebody else will, and they turn it into an auction. Had the town said, 
we're going to screen all of you folks and we're going to pick out the two best operators and then we're going to let you go out in the market. Two operators against eight landlords are going to get a great deal because now the landlords have to compete to get the operators versus the operators competing with the landlords. In Framingham, Massachusetts, there was a landlord during the rush that was actually said, I got the space and you pay me some money and I will give you a letter that you can bring to the town or the city by that point, because they changed their municipal structure in order to see if you can get a host community agreement, because we know they're only going to limit. They're only going to let one of you come into this location. You know, for a landlord to say, I'm not going to charge you $2,000 for the letter or 5,000 for the letter. People were lining up to pay it. I know one landlord had three different people they had signed letters of intent with because they knew only one of them could get the location. When the landlords have the power, the landlords are going to do what they should do, which is maximize the value of their property, which is force you to bid it up. Right. You need to be willing to walk away from those kind of deals, knowing that it may be painful for the first couple of years when you watch somebody open up and they're doing great. But once the market hits a saturation point, those are the people that are going to hurt the most. It's a great point there, David. Yep. I, I think I'm going to leave it sort of right here. Um, I, I'm out of shit. Um, <laughs> I usually leave the last word for my guest. I want to thank you for your time so much. It's been a my fascinating pleasure. conversation. Yeah. Thanks so much for being here. Um, if there's anything we missed or if you'd care to like, I don't know if you care to uh, tell us what the name of your new company is going to be or if that's still a secret, but if there's anything well, we missed shameless plugs or shout outs, uh, now's the time. Dude. Okay, great. So the name of our company is stones throw cannabis. Um, I believe we're going to operate under the name Firebrand Cannabis. We'll be in downtown Boston on Atlantic Avenue, directly across the street from South Station. We got our zoning approval last week, which was absolutely phenomenally huge. Um, we, we are, we've been, our application's been deemed complete by the Cannabis Control Commission once we get the zoning approval. And we're hoping that if we get lucky, we may get our provisional license by June. We don't have to do any build out because we found a location that was in great shape. So I, we were very, very conscious about that because build out is expensive. Um, next week, we're going to start moving in the display cases and the racks that I was talking about and trying to get the setup going. Um, on the other side of things where I'm doing consulting work, you can find me on LinkedIn. You've got my name spelled with a V, not a W. Yeah, sorry. Uh, it's down on the bottom, but that's okay, Caleb. We talked about how that happens back in, you know, a century ago at Ellis Island. Um, or find me at canaventurelabs.com. I do a lot with helping people figure out how to navigate the municipal process. Um, get the right presentation because I'm good at thinking about what is the party on the other side want. And I'm well known for helping with the, on the, on, when you have to do your financial planning, I build some of the best models in the industry. I speak regularly at conferences on things like um, how to create winning financial presentations investors love. Uh, I work with accounting buds out of New Jersey on that type of stuff, as well as a number of other accounting and law firms. Um, and I'm a pretty easy guy to find, as you know, because you found me. <laughs> well, David, thank you so much for being here. This has been a pleasure. Um, I hope we can pick this up like in six months. It would do a little follow up and, and see how things are going, man. I want to wish you the best of luck with your with your business venture. Um, thank you. Like you got yourself a ridiculous location. Yeah. Well, we're hoping so. Hmm. Well, well, good luck, man. And if federal legalization hits, I know some guys that can set you up with some fire. Okay, that sounds great, Caleb. Thank you. This has been All a right. lot of fun. Thanks so much for being here. I'm going to sign it off for David Rabinowitz. I'm Caleb Teske, reminding you that the devil is in the details and the details are in the fine print. Thank you, David. Have a good night, everybody. Peace.